Okay, so this is a pretty common situation for most performing musicians. It's the big day, and you're about to go on stage to perform, maybe for an audience that's eager to hear you, or you're playing an audition for some professionals who know your instrument just as well as you do. Whatever the case is, you've been practicing for months, not to mention all the years you spent learning your instrument just to get to this point already. So you're a little nervous, which is totally normal, and you're dealing with it by telling yourself to, you know, stay positive, you got this, just keep that confidence level high. The only problem is your subconscious isn't buying that. Your subconscious is worried. Worried about that note. You know the one. It's that one that you practiced for like 10 hours, but you still feel like this kid every time you try to play it. <laughs> okay, I'm, all right, I'm sorry. Look, you got this. You, let's just go for it and see how it goes. Performing like this just isn't sustainable. Eventually you'll have something go badly and it's just going to get harder and harder to bounce back. The problem here isn't being nervous, it's deeper than that. It's a fear of making mistakes. And the irony is that it doesn't even really matter if you hit that note because your general audience is going to pick up on all the tension in your body language. And even if you're playing an audition behind a screen, that hesitancy is going to come through in your sound. Plus, obsessing over intonation just takes away focus from other important parts of your playing. It's easy to think that the solution lies in what you tell yourself just before a performance because that's when you feel the greatest pressure, right? And there are lots of valid strategies to employ in those moments and it's worth thinking about for sure. But those moments aren't the right place to be looking for a solution to this kind of problem because a problem like this one doesn't appear just from the pressure of the moment, it's amplified by the pressure of the moment. Meaning that the problem was already there before you even got to the performance venue. So to figure out how to get over this, you have to look back to where you spend most of your time with your instrument. The practice room. If you're having trouble staying focused and playing freely during performances, it's because of what you're doing in here, long before you got to the performance venue. And the reason why is simple. Everything that you do in here gets reinforced, both your physical abilities and your thought patterns. We tend to focus just on the physical side of practice and ignore the mental one, but that's what needs to be addressed. Practicing is thought of solely as the way to get better at our instruments, but that's not really what practicing is. That's what we want practicing to do for us. We practice so that we get better. The act of practicing isn't inherently a good or bad thing, it's just a process where we repeat a certain action a ton of times so that it becomes a habit. You can even think of it as a mathematical equation. Take a certain action, repeat it a ton of times, and good or bad, it'll eventually become a habit. With the physical side of playing, it's fairly easy to see how this works. If you were to practice long tones, for instance, you'll get better at controlling your bow speed. But if you do that while unconsciously holding a lot of tension in your shoulder, you'll also get good at holding tension in your shoulder, which for the record, it's not such a great thing for a string player, or anybody else, really. So, in other words, what you get out of practicing is what you put into it. Knowing that the end result of this process is an undesired, cautious approach to playing, let's put those ninth grade algebra skills to use and solve for X. What are the actions being repeated in the practice room that are reinforcing this habit? How is this kind of playing being practiced? In order to identify those actions and learn how this happens, we're first going to have to understand why we're doing this to ourselves. Like, Obviously, we don't want to be doing this to ourselves, right? I don't want to be playing like this, but it's happening, right? It's some kind of reflexive, protective behavior. The interesting thing is the urge to protect yourself is a really normal thing to do. Like, it's an evolutionary thing to do. We protect ourselves from perceived threats. But then that begs the question, what are the perceived threats in performance situations? Like, what's the bad thing that's going to happen to you if you play out of tune, for instance? Now, this is different for everyone. Maybe you're really worried about embarrassing yourself in front of friends and colleagues, or you really want the gig and think that not getting it would be an unacceptable failure, a condemnation of your self-worth. Acknowledging your threats will help you recognize the protective behaviors you're taking in the practice room. And those are the actions that cause this problem. Fearful playing is practiced by consistently engaging in protective behaviors. To show you what this looks like, I'll share a recent example from my own practice. A few weeks back, I decided to learn the Charlie Parker tune Donnelly, <clears throat> which you should check out here. And it's a really tough look in a style I have very little experience with, so I'm doing a lot of slow practice. And in one of my sessions, I decided that I would play a bit faster than I was comfortable with, and the goal would be to play as easily as possible. A successful repetition would be one where everything felt relaxed instead of one that was executed accurately. So when I started playing at this new tempo, I played a lot of notes out of tune, it was sloppy, and just hard to listen to. I understandably really wanted to fix it, make it sound better, like who wouldn't, right? I had two choices in that moment. I could either stick with my original goal, or start fixing it. Let's say I went back and started fixing it. 
What would I have done? Well, first I'd have thrown out that well-designed goal of playing comfortably, which is a lost opportunity to learn how I can make my technique more efficient. And second, I'd have done it to make myself feel better, to protect myself from my internal critics. It's a protective behavior. It's like I'm telling myself that if I don't fix them immediately, I won't be taking the chance to prove those critics wrong. So instead I had to ignore the urge to fix my imperfections because proving anything to those critics, even proving them wrong, still means that you're playing to their twisted standards instead of following your own inspiration. You're giving them control. In this particular practice session, the way I understood how to move past that urge was for me to say to myself, it's okay to play out of tune. Like I literally had to say it out loud to myself and it felt empowering. It meant that I could continue on with my goal of observing the efficiency of my playing and trust that mistakes like pitch or cleanliness could be fixed later, which is huge because it implies that I know how to fix those problems. It's the opposite of a protective behavior. It's a reaffirming one, one that builds confidence. The interesting thing is on paper, we know that a mindset that finds mistakes as unacceptable is toxic and we reject it. And yet, as I just described, it's super common in the practice room to act like we think that mistakes are unacceptable. Actions speak louder than words, right? Every time you act on what you think is unacceptable, you're just entrenching that belief. You're reaffirming it in a way. And what's so sinister about these protective behaviors is that they're such natural things for musicians to do. Like, obviously you wanna play as in tune as possible and make as little mistakes as possible. And so it's really easy to think that the hallmark of a great practice session is correcting all those mistakes, which it is, as long as you understand how and why you're doing it. For something like intonation, I think it's a good habit to set aside time for that subject alone. Like, practice scales so that you only have to focus on your pitch, or while you're practicing slowly, tell yourself that the goal of that session in particular is to improve your pitch. Because yes, we need to be able to play in tune, but having intonation as an example be a prerequisite for any other part of your playing is just limiting. Chances are good that if you start focusing on other parts of your playing, the original problem, whether it was intonation or rhythm or sound quality, it'll improve on its own a lot more naturally than if you focused on it excessively and obsessively. Because the end result of all of this is building trust. Removing those protective behaviors from your practice is empowering. It's telling yourself that you know what you're doing, that you know how to play well, and that mistakes aren't indicators of a larger problem, they're just mistakes, a normal part of performing anything at a high level. Once you start looking for your protective behaviors, you'll start noticing them everywhere. I still find lots in my own practice, and I'll share with you a few examples of some that I experienced that I'm willing to bet I'm not alone in experiencing. One I remember doing a lot when I was younger was making a face every time I made a mistake. It's like a way of communicating to your audience that yes, I'm aware that I'm making a mistake, and no, I'm not so bad at my instrument that I'd make mistakes and not notice them, okay? Another common one happens during recordings where you can't get past the first minute of music because some little error happens along the way. Each time you stop over something trivial, you're making it harder not to stop the next time, and the next thing you know, you've spent four hours recording three minutes of music. Last one I'll mention, and this one I've dealt with a lot in my own practice, and that's stubbornness. It's refusing to move on to other areas of your practice or other parts of a piece because one little note doesn't feel right and you just can't seem to fix it. I used to tell myself that it just meant I wasn't working hard enough, but really I just wasn't willing to let it go. Getting trapped in this version of perfectionism can get destructive quickly, so being able to move on is a really powerful step to take. Rooting out these protective behaviors from your practice won't magically get you the gig or make you 10 times better overnight, but it will put you in a position to be much more likely to succeed under pressure. And that's because learning to accept mistakes is how you build trust. And trust means that you know that making mistakes doesn't make you a terrible player. You'll just view them more as outliers instead of red flags. And with that mindset, you'll be much more likely to be able to grow rapidly as a musician, which at the end of the day is really all we can strive for. So I hope you found this video helpful. It was certainly helpful for me in making it because it helped me solidify these ideas. But if you liked it, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe and leave a comment if you've got questions and I'll see you in the next one.